management complications and prevention this is a huge talk by itself you know it'll take hours together if I go into details so I think the idea today will be to give you a flavor of a few management practices that you can use you know what are the complications to look out what are the methods by which you know we can prevent them all right I have only one disclosure I am a faculty for ELSO for their courses We'll have a case, we'll have some trends of ECMO, a few points about physiology, some management pearls, and complications. All right, I want uh, <clears throat> our entire group here to be interactive with me on this case. So this is a 54-year-old viral myocarditis patient uh, with cardiogenic shock and was in V ECMO for five days. And you know, if you see the vitals, fairly okay. He was in high flow, 10 liters, 50%, heparin, 16 units, tags were fine, ECMO flow is 4.9, sweep 2, FIO to 60%, gases were unremarkable. So in fact, the next day you come in and you see that the urine output starts dropping for the past four hours. B1 creatinine starts rising. You just go for a coffee break and you come back and there's a code blue. And you rush and you see VTEC on the screen. You send gas, labs, labs calls you and then says that there is a hyperkalemia. So now I'll open it to the audience. What do you think we should do? Should we reduce the ECMO flow completely or reduce it further, do CPR, you know, ACLS, intubate, calcium, gluconate, and the hyperkalemia cocktail? Or we should increase the ECMO flow, do CPR and everything else? We should increase ECMO flow, ACLS, defib, intubate, or decrease what should we do? What do you guys think we should do? Anyone for decreasing the ECMO flow? Anyone for increasing the ECMO flow? I think she wants to increase the ECMO flow. Okay, good. So the point I was trying to make with this slide is that it's very important to understand, you know, there is something called cellular death and there's a clinical death. You know, we all have been trained that when your heart stops working, you have clinical death, right? Your heart's not working. But when a patient is on ECMO, may, you know, especially via ECMO, it could be that their cells are still perfused because you're actually having uh, oxygenated blood going through completely. So when you're on a VV circuit, you know, and you're on, you know, you, no respiratory support, you need CPR, you may need lower flow, consider conversion to VA. On a VA, when you have no respiratory support, you know, you don't have to do a CPR because necessarily you need to go after the reason for the cardiac arrest. So in this case, the cardiac arrest was because of hyperkalemia. So it is not important to do CPR because you're already having good flows. In fact, when you do CPR, you might be actually making things worse, you know, more bleeding, and then whatever retrograde flow is happening to the coronaries, that might be stopped. All right. Let's talk about trends. So this is the latest 2017 data that came out from ELSO. You know, it only shows the same thing what people have shown in, in the last slides. The number of cases of ECMO, VV, VA have been rising. Centers have been rising that they have been doing. Probably better outcomes or similar outcomes in the last 10 years. But the key point is there has been a 433% increase in adult ECMO. This particular article was cited more than 500 times in the last four or five years. So this is a very key finding in the last decade. With all the experience that we had, the CESAR trial, the 2009 experience with influenza, more and more centers are using ECMO now. So the question is, why? Why is this increase? You know, is this better patient selection? We have more provider experience, is that the reason? Is it the technological advances in cannulation, circuitry, pumps, our knowledge of anticoagulation? If you see on top, you know, ECMO looked like that in the 1970s. And now we have ECMOs which are really very compact that you can take to, to the field. Use of lung protective strategies. You know, that over the last years have increased or improved the outcomes of ARDS in general. And it's also touched the outcomes of ECMO. Better sedation practices, early ambulation, all these things have really improved the outcomes of ECMO in the last 
10, 15 years. So the idea of this slide was just to show that what are the practices we can use in our practice, in our daily routine uh, in caring for ECMO patients. So before we go into management pearls about uh, you know, various practices for VV and VECMO, I just want to share with you a few slides about ECMO physiology. How does the pump work? How does the oxygenator work? You know, what are the physiological points behind it? So the ECMO is just like a human being, you know, an artificial human being, you can say. It has a pump that is equal to your heart that provides circuit flow or blood flow. You have an oxygenator, which is just like your lungs, and it provides gas exchange. All right. So circuit pressure. So you know, if you have a VACMO or a VVACMO, you know, the ways you can have flow is through the pump. You can have an artificial pump in there. Now you can have something called an AVACMO, which is a pumpless uh, ECMO system where your heart acts like a pump. However, you can think about it. If you, your heart acts like a pump, you really cannot have very high flows. So in cases where you just have to deal with removal of CO2, you know, systems like ECOR, these are the systems where you can use your heart as the pump for ECMO and get away with low flows and removal of carbon dioxide. So this slide, I think, is very, very important to understand before we go ahead and uh, you know, uh, do more management tips on ECMO. So everybody should know, the first thing that I learned from our perfusion group here was what are the pressures that are present in, a different, you know, in, in the ECMO circuit? What is negative? What is positive? What is a safe zone? So if you see here, this is called the axis. So this is a negative pressure. So this is the pump. Just before the pump is the pre-pump. That is a negative pressure. So blood is being sucked in. So that's a negative pressure. And just immediately after the pump, you have positive pressure. Then you have the oxygenator, and everything is positive. Now let's see here. What if I have some kind of you know, lure lock here, and I accidentally open it? What's going to happen? It's a negative pressure system. Air is going to go in, right? So very important to know that this is a negative part of the cell. Now, what do you think? Which part is the safest zone in your circuit? What do you guys think? Do you think this is the safest zone or this is the safest zone? One or two? This is one, this is two. One, right? So absolutely, this part between the pump and your oxygenator is actually the safest zone. The reason, one, you're positive. Let's say even you know, some wild guy decides that I'm going to push five cc's of air in it just see, to see what happens. No problem. You've got this oxygenator here. It's going to suck it in. This is a port, de-airing port, you know, which can actually let the air out. So it's a fairly safe area to connect anything if you want to connect uh, a CRRT device, you know, inline uh, hemoconcentrator. You can all put it in here. Post side is also fairly safe. Unfortunately, it's very high pressure. So you have to be a little bit careful when you're opening things out. And you can have a lot of blood loss over there. All right. So just like our heart, what are, the, what are the things that define or determine the circuit flow? So in our heart, there's a preload, you know, your contractility, and then there's an afterload. Same thing here. You have a preload. So how much of blood is getting into the, into the circuit or into the pump? Contractly, what are your RPMs of your pump? Number three, afterload. So afterload means many things. You know, if you have a clot in the system somewhere, afterload increases and automatically your flows drop. If you have very high systemic pressures in VV ECMO, automatically you'll have decreased flows. All right, so this graph basically just shows that as your outlet pressures or afterload increases, automatically your flow stops dropping. So nothing more than that. It is. Okay, all right. This is also a very, very interesting uh, slide. If you see, look at here. Let's say, for example, you have a patient who comes in and pre-ECMO is sats at 70%. Now you need to know if your desire post-ECMO is to keep the sats 90%. The question is how much of the cardiac output or the circuit flow, how much of the cardiac output should be captured by the circuit flow? That's very important, especially in VVAC, and we'll talk more about it. So if you just trace here, let's do the 70% and go all the way back. 
we need 90, right? We need 90. So you need to have at least 70% of your circuit flow if you want to have 90% oxygenation <coughs> post ECMO. So it's a very, very beautiful, important circuit, you know, physiology concept in ECMO that your oxygenation is a determinant of how much of the cardiac output you actually capture with your, with your circuit. Again, as I talk to you, what are the things that can compromise your uh, circuit flows? If you have access insufficiency, you know, like a kink, a clot, or patient is coughing, Valsalva, then you can have decreased preload or decreased amount of fluid or blood going into your circuit. Contractility, if your RPMs are not good, if you have very low RPMs, if your flows are not good, that's one. Afterload, if you have an oxygenator failure, that means there's very high pressure in the oxygenator. If you have a kink in the post, if you have too much of vasopressors in there and you're con completely clamped down, or your native LV output, you know, is bad. Okay, gas exchange, this is uh, uh, one of the oxygenators. This is a card rock oxygenator inside polymethylpentene is the, uh, the substance which is used to make, to make the, uh, the oxygenator and the gas exchange part of this. And it is a very, very thin uh, uh, membrane. And if you see here, it's just coiled over each other and placed there just to increase the surface area. So again, oxygenation here depends primarily on the blood flow rate and the carboxylation depends primarily on the sweep gas flow. So we'll talk about, you know, sweep, we'll talk about FiO2 in our later slides, just to give more clarity. All right, so as you all know, you know, just even in the human body, CO2 has great diffusion capacity. It's almost, you know, four times that of oxygen. Uh, you know, especially here, whereas in the human body it's 200, up to 200 times higher. So the oxygen is always disadvantaged. That's the reason why if you want to have good saturation on ECMO, you know, or post ECMO, you need to capture more and more amounts of cardiac output. However, if, if your thought or if your uh, problem with the patient is only ventilation, that means if they have very high CO2 levels, you really do not need, a, you know, that much of flow. You can get by with flows as low as two liters and get rid of all your CO2 because of the diffusion capacity of uh, CO2. All right, so <clears throat> just uh, talking about the same concept of capturing the, you know, the cardiac output. So if you see here, you've got five liters of flow total, you know, cardiac output is five liters. You have three and a half liters that is going through the ECMO circuit and one and a half liters that goes through your native circulation that's going to your heart and your native lungs. Now let's go to another scenario. See what's happening here. You still have three and a half liters going in here, okay? But look at the amount of flow that's going through the native circulation. It's increased, so that's a shunt fraction. So the amount, now in this particular case, your oxygenation may be your you know, arterial sats really drop down, your oxygenation goes down, overhead sats go to 70%, 60%. The reason for that is that you've not really captured enough of your cardiac output here in this second case. So sometimes, again, I'm not saying that we should do it all the times. Sometimes if your patient is anxious for some reason, you know, your heart rate increases, then automatically, you know, heart rate, stroke volume, that's your cardiac output that goes up, right? So. If you determine this is not sepsis, this is not infection, and this may be just an increase in the heart rate for some reason, you know, if it's fevers, you control the fevers. If you don't understand what's going on, people have even used beta blockers to reduce the heart rate so that you could capture more and more about CO2. Because really, it's, it's impossible to go to six or seven or eight liters uh, of flow on ECMO easily. It's, it's unheard of, it cannot be done, unfortunately. All right, this is the same thing again. We'll skip this slide. All right. <clears throat> so let's talk uh, about the hemodynamic monitoring on ECMO. You know, what should we expect when we have patients on VV and VA ECMO? So let's talk about the CVP or, you know, uh, 
central venous pressure. So in VV ECMO, if you see, there is actually no change in the CVP. You know, of course, if you have an Avalon here, it's hard to determine what the real CVP is. But if you have a traditional model, you know, FEM, FEM, usually the CVP doesn't change. Whereas in a VA ECMO, you can actually have reduction in your CVP. And the reason for that is that you're having retrograde flow, you're pulling and you're reducing your preload. What about the PA pressures? So again, in VV, as long as your left heart's okay, your PA pressures or wedge pressures usually do not change. PA pressures can change if you have too much of flows in there, but usually the wedge doesn't change as long as your heart's okay. Whereas in a VA circuit, you can have reduction in your wedge pressures. Now the only one time, if you have uh, a completely dead heart, and if you're having a retrograde flow, and if your LV is distended, then of course you can have high PA pressures. But when you start, you can actually expect a reduction in the wedge pressure. So this is a very nice uh, experiment that was done in Amsterdam, in Netherlands, by a group ICU physicians. And they looked at uh, 16 patients, and they looked at uh, what effect does uh, ECMO have on PA pressures and RV function. So as you all know, patients who have ARDS, if they have high CO2s, they can have RV dysfunction, they can have very elevated PA pressures because of hypoxia. So they placed all these guys on uh, ECMO and they checked the baseline and a 60 minutes and then they did a subsequent 7, 720 minutes, a 12 hour uh, calculation. All of these people had swans in there. So they found that the mean PA pressures actually significantly reduced after 60 minutes in uh, patients who had uh, ECMO, who were put on ECMO. And if you see all the parameters from PEEP, your tidal volumes, everything, you were able to reduce everything down uh, with ECMO. What would you see in uh, an A-line when you have uh, VA and VV ECMO? So if you have a VV ECMO, as long as your heart's okay, you don't see a change. You know, there's no change in MAP, the tracing is normal. Whereas in a VA ECMO, it's all determined by your native function, native heart function. So if your heart is completely dead, then you don't have a pulse style flow. So one of the ways to check uh, in VA ECMO when you're about to wean, one of the very uh, early indicators is when you start having pulsatility back, it could be, it could be again, not in all cases, it could be a sign that your heart's recovering because there is some native function there. And you can reduce your flows and see if that gets better. All right, let's now get into some management strategies. So this is a very, very famous picture that was, this, this is an experiment done on ex vivo lungs by Dreyfus in France. It was published in the 1990s in the Blue Journal. And it showed that if you put a normal lungs and if you give pressure to the normal lungs, you know, 45 centimeters of water for five minutes, I mean, something happens, but if you do the same thing for 20 minutes, very high pressures, look what happens to the lung. There's a lot of volume trauma, barrel trauma that happens. Same thing in the 2000s, early 2000s for ARDS, we had the, the uh, ARDS net trials, which showed that low tidal volume ventilation was protective and had some mortality benefit. Following study, this showed that no matter what your tidal volumes are, no matter what your peeps are, one of the most important things for lung protection is actually the plateau pressure. So if you see here, as your plateau pressure increases, your relative risk of death is actually going up. So what is the reason I'm showing you all these slides? The reason for that is, especially if you have VV ECMO, the idea behind that is to actually do these three things. To limit your tidal volumes, to have optimal PEEP, and to reduce your plateau pressure. So it's very important to understand that fundamental, that putting people on ECMO, we can put everybody on ECMO, but outcomes heavily depend and are heavily dependent on the strategies that we use uh, post deployment of ECMO. So the goals of VV ECMO, of course, maintain adequate tissue perfusion, and that can be done with your uh, ECMO circuitry, your high flow needle cannula, mechanical ventilation, com combination of everything. Volume and pressure limitation, you could do low tidal volume, ultra low tidal volume ventilation. So when people are on ECMO, many centers now are putting them on two cc's, three cc's tidal volume and getting the lungs to rest completely. Improve RV dysfunction, I already showed you the slide. 
as you get hypercapnic, your RV goes bad. This has been shown several times. So the idea is to, you can actually correct acidemia, you can correct get, you know, P, you know, your CO2, and you can improve RV function and potentially get off a lot of pressors. And the most important thing is actually minimize ECMO complication. So, you know, Dr. Hoops, uh, when I was a fellow here, used to uh, tell me that when you have a patient on mechanical ventilation, you already have one whammy. And he used to say, you're putting this guy on ECMO, now you have a double whammy. So that's uh, Dr. Hoops' statement. So it's not wrong, actually. Because you can put everybody on ECMO, but if you don't do the right things, if you don't minimize the ECMO complications, it's going to be disastrous. That's what happened in the 1970s, once the Zappol and all, when they did their initial trial. Everybody was in ECMO, but nobody knew what they were doing. So people died, the mortality was same, but people on ECMO had worse complications. So very important to understand, to limit complications, and to pick up these complications early so that you could intervene. And of course, await lung re recovery. So to start, you know, I don't know if somebody has already talked about this. I'm not going to dwell too much on it. First, you have to figure out, yes, whether this guy needs VACMO or he needs VVACMO. If yes, what is the cannulation strategy that I should choose? Okay. Now, there are different strategies. You can have for VVACMO, you can have femoral, femoral or fem fem. You can have fem jug. You can have juggler femoral. You can have a dual lumen like your Protec Duo, or you can have the Avalon catheter. So very important to see, you know, what I should choose. Now, centers who are starting new, like including the center that I have gone to, they don't have a lot of experience doing Avalon catheter. So I've done in the last uh, six months <clears throat> 10 odd cases, and we've had almost five cases where we had the Avalon get into the RV. So here at UAB, you know, 80% of the practice for VV ECMO is still Avalon's. And since there's so much of experience, these kind of things are very, very rare. So it's all dependent on where, uh, you know, what you can do. And some of our folks who cannulate are not very comfortable. So we are doing a lot of fem fem right now. But I just learned, and I didn't know it here, I've been actually ambulating my patients on fem fem. You can actually ambulate, you have to be careful so that it doesn't get out but you can potentially ambulate them on FemFem. Dual lumen, of course, is the best if you want to really make your patients awake and ambulate. All right, so what do we do once we get this patient on? So Dr. Willi used to teach me when I was a fellow, I used to ask him, hey, now the patient's on, what do you want me to tell? You know, the nurse used to ask me, hey, what do you want to start on the perfusion? Hey, what flows do you want? I used to think, why don't you start him on four liters of flow? And I thought, and four of sweep. I, at that point, I really did not get, he used to tell me to start there, but I really did not get, why is he asking me to start four and four? Or say, can I start four and three? So it's a very simple concept. You have to have VQ matching. That's what you want to do. So you're basically starting VQ one is to one, flows, perfusion, and your gas exchange. So once you start that and you initiate flows 50 to 80 ml per kg, look for color change, look for improvements in overhead gases. That's what you have to look. And then, of course, you titrate your flows, you titrate your sweep gas based on the gases, arterial gases that you get. Check the patient. So very important, VV ECMO especially. Do not look at numbers. Very important to look at the patient. You're treating the patient. So wean ventilator as soon as possible. So we did, uh, for one of the studies here, I did a retrospective chart abstraction to see what were the tidal volumes we were using uh, for patients post ECMO. I was very surprised that our tidal volumes in the initial part, not later on, were 900 cc's. We never bothered to touch the ventilator. We just put them in ECMO, we had beautiful gas, and we said, all right, all's done, man. But that's not the case. Very important. You have to go down, get your tidal volumes down. It doesn't matter. Use volume control, pressure control, whatever you want. Get the tidal volumes down. Get the peep down. You don't have to get the peep down to five. If you keep it 10, your platy pressures are okay, leave it alone. Now maintenance. So it's again, going back to the same thing we talked about, what do we have to, you know, what do we have to titrate this to? We have to titrate this to the patient. We want to keep your SATs 80 to 85%. If it's 90% without a problem, it's not wrong. You don't have to go dial down anything. But again, <clears throat> if everything is okay, that means end organ perfusion is okay. If your delivery of oxygen is good, so if you have an Avalon patient, he's completely awake, he's talking to you, peeing really well, but 
it's saturating 85% or 80%, I don't think there's any reason to get worried about it and start cranking things up. You can leave it there because what's the end goal? End goal is end organ perfusion. If your brain and kidneys, they're the first people who die if you have low, if you have hypoxia. If they're doing fine, are you worried? And the reason for that is delivery of oxygen. What is delivery of oxygen? It's a product of your PO2s and your hemoglobin. Now again, I'm not asking you to ramp up the hemoglobin to 15. Dr. Bartlett, the guy who did, Bob Bartlett who started, he likes to keep everything at 15. You know, he told me, if it were to me, I would keep every patient's hemoglobin normal, 15. But we have realized that that's not really needed. So <clears throat> it's all about what the patient is doing. Titrate everything to the patient. So adjust gas flow, you know, gold, PCO2, pH, whatever you guys decide as a group, you could do that. Monitor the circuit pressures. So very important. What we learned here at UAB was that <clears throat> if you start having predetermined notions that you have to keep your flows four, four and a half, whatever, no matter what the patient is doing, you get into a lot of complication. I'll give you an example. To achieve four, and my first day uh, on practice in Tampa, uh, our surgeon asked uh, for a different reason to keep a patient's flow at four. Now I went there, and the overhead sats were 95%. The patient was extubated, awake, everything was good. But the flows were dropping. They were going to three and a half, so <coughs> something called chugging. If you have too much of negative pressure, it's chugging. So as a result of that, we checked everything, and the team decided to give fluids to the patient. This is the patient who had ARDS. Kept on giving fluids, kept on giving fluids. Because our goal was, not the patient, our goal was four liters of flow. So after some time, we realized that this guy now has pulmonary edema, you know, because we already, already put like two and a half liters of albumin in him. So we said, we're actually killing the patient, right? The guy was already doing 85, you know, 95%. All we did was we reduced the RPMs and we got the flows to three and a half liters. We were still 95%. So what difference does it make? So important to know that it is the patient who will tell you what to do. And again, of course, you, can, you have to monitor some pressures. So negative access pressures, if you have a lot of negative access pressure, you know, as it increases, there is an increased risk of hemolysis. There's an increased risk of bleeding also. And this comes from bad literature. So in the bad literature, when you have more negative pressures, it cleaves your von Willebrand factor. The same things have been seen in animal models in ECMO. You have higher negative access pressures, you cleave that, you have increased incidence of bleeding. Lung rest, so what do you do with the ventilator? You know, we talked about it. You know, we reduce your FiO2 as low as possible. You know, 40% to 60% is okay. So, in, so is 60% okay, 40%? Nobody knows that answer. But <clears throat> the experts have determined that anything less than 60% seems not to have the free radical injury that happens with the lung. So there was an experiment that was done on animal, on dogs actually. And to find out what is the PO2 that actually in, in the systemic circulation that causes free radical injury. And they found that it was 160. So again, the general idea is 60%. So go below 60% as soon as you can. Tidal volumes, again, two to six liters. You can even drop it even further if you want, as long as you're able to maintain gas exchange. Palatal pressures, as low as possible. So <clears throat> we've been taught 30, 30, 30, but my, the idea is go as low as possible. You know, as long as the patient is okay, all the other parameters okay. Respiratory rate, you could go low. You can, you know, less than 10 rest. Beep. Again, PEEP, the idea is you don't have to go back to five, thinking that five is physiological PEEP, because PEEP is a very, very interesting thing. You know, if you have a post-op patient who just had a stenotomy, has very bad chest wall compliance, a PEEP of 10 may not be bad for them, or a PEEP of 15 may not be bad for them, right? Because they have opposing forces. So you just have to look at the patient's overall body habitus and determine what amount of PEEP you want. If possible, you can consider extubation. A lot of centers, for non-ARDS reasons, they are going ahead and extubating the patient, especially if you're bridging them to lung transplantation. But for most uh, people who have ARDS, <clears throat> an early tracheostomy helps them to get awake, you know, be off sedation, and you know, potentially be on trach collar or just some CPAP. I'll leave this, this is the same thing to show that uh, most centers post uh, 
ECMO, decided to keep PEEPs in moderate levels. All right, the next question that comes uh, is bronchoscopy for, you know, uh, folks who are pulmonologists here for ARDS patients. Should we bronch them? Should we not bronch them? Is bronch uh, bad to do be done on ECMO? Uh, does it help in any way? So to answer that question, uh, Dr. Willie and myself, we looked a few years back, we published a couple of papers on this, and we found our, our question was, we were doing a lot of uh, bronchoscopies, and our colleagues were asking, you know, is this benefiting, number one? Number two, are you actually causing more damage to the patient? So my idea was the patients are on ECMO, so they're already supported, uh, because the general idea on patients who are on mechanical ventilator, if they're very hypoxic, is that if you don't need, you should not do, you should not be doing bronchoscopies, although that dogma had been uh, <clears throat> removed before. So we actually found, if you see the p-values on the right side, all marked uh, with the red, we actually found no difference, no statistical difference in patient's hemodynamics before or immediately after, you know, a few hours after bronchoscopy. So we found it to be very safe. And in the next paper, we had a group of <clears throat> eight patients who we actually used a bed to move them side to side, basically to keep one lung up, one lung down, and we did bronchoscopies for all these patients to remove excessive secretions. We actually found that in these six patients, as against we compared it with six non-patients who did not receive that. We found that they actually recovered faster. But again, it's hard to say if there were other factors which led to this. But you know, just looking at this in a non-scientific way, we found that it really improved. Now the next part is weaning. <clears throat> How do you know that the patient is getting better and now is the time to wean? Well, it's pretty simple, right? Your x is improving, gas exchange is getting better, okay? And sometimes what happens is you, if your x-rays are getting better, do you really have to go down on your settings on the ECMO to really see that if things are getting better. Otherwise, sometimes you stay static for days without making any change. So it's very important every day if you see things are getting better, try to go down, challenge the patient, see what they can do. <clears throat> and we can reduce the extracorporeal support simultaneously. You can go up on your minute ventilation in these patients if you're going down on sweep so that you can have a you know, decent minute ventilation. It's important not to go down on your uh, blood flows less than two. Ideally, if you are on VV ECMO, most, most people will tell you there's no need to really titrate the blood flow. It's more important to titrate the sweep down. But you can do both, there's no harm. If your PO2s are 200, there's no need to have flows which are four. And <clears throat> If you go below two liters, there's a slight increased risk of clotting the circuit. That's why most people keep it two, two and a half liters. Again, <clears throat> it's very variable among centers. We knew arterial support. What is the, again, what is the goal of VA support? The support is to prevent further organ injury, provide rest, await cardiac recovery, or a bridge to VAD or a transplant. Titrate support to organ perfusion ventilation titrate the support to pulsatility. So that's the difference with, between VA and VV here. Monitor for distal limb perfusion if you're on the peripheral. <clears throat> so again, here I'll not go too much into this. There's several configurations. You can have a subclavian, you can have fem femoral, you can have true central cannulation through a sternotomy approach. You can have different or mini sternotomy approaches. But important again here, important to see the patient. You know, here our goals are slightly different. We're not aiming at an 85% SAT or 80% SAT. Here, we're aiming for something different. We're aiming for a MAP, more than 65, a mixed mean of 65 to 70%, you know, lactic clearance, and overhead SATs. Here, the overhead SATs of 70% may not work because you're actually directly putting blood, completely bypassing everything and putting, you know, deoxygenated blood into the brain. That doesn't work. So you want to keep your mixed meanness, I mean, or it sets about 90%. So next thing is you provide, like on the other VV side, we did lung rest. Here we do heart rest. So very important, reduce your vasoactive medications, lowest inotrope possible, lowest vasopressor possible. That's what we have to do. Then you have to look for other things than VV, VA ECMO especially. You have to make sure there's no LV distension, especially when you're on a fem-fem approach. 
They're actually shooting blood retrograde into the aorta. If your heart's completely dead, what's going to happen? Ultimately, everything is going in there. There's no resistance. You'll have pooling of blood into your LV, and you get distension. You get a white duct. Very commonly seen in fem fem. You have to monitor for LV recovery. Very important. How do you do that? You see pulsatility sometimes, and you reduce your flow. You do an echo every so often to see if things are improving. So <clears throat> the last speakers, they already talked about LV distension. But here, in this case, let's say, for example, your heart is completely dead, and you're having retrograde flow, and you have a lot of LV distension. What are the things you can do? There's some <clears throat> novel catheter techniques, which Tandem Life is one of them. They have a transeptal catheter. You can use that. You could use impeller, you know, two and a half, five, whatever you like. You can have uh, balloon pumps, you can place that. Or you can actually, some people, they just make uh, uh, <clears throat> a hole in the heart. So or you basically create a shunt in the heart uh, enough so that you can put everything into the other side. Or you could add inotropes to have some squeeze from the LV. But if, if you have no contractility, the chance that you'll improve anything with an inotrope is very minimal. All right. Let's talk about differential hypoxia. Very, very important uh, concept in VACMO. So think about this. Now we talked about a dead heart. We talked about LV distension. We talked about pulling of blood into the heart. Now, if you have recovery of your native function, what's going to happen? So let's say you have four liters of flow, right? So there are two, two liters of flow is still going to your native circulation. So that goes anterograde, and now you have a retrograde flow. All right, we'll come back here, sorry. So you have now two opposing forces. One is your native heart circulation, that is anterograde forward, and now you have a, you know, an ECMO flow which is coming from below retrograde. So now the battle is who is stronger, he wins the battle. So sometimes that happens is that if your native function is really good and you're in peripheral ECMO and it throws out some kind of blood, oxygenated or deoxygenated, doesn't matter, it goes forward then your ECMO has to work backwards. So they have to fight. And whoever has more energy, power, pushes. So there's called the zone of mixing or the cloud of mixing. So blood mixes at a point. Now it's very important, the concept is very important. Now say for example, if you know the, <clears throat> the arch of iota, you have supply to the right side which comes all the way here, and you have supply to the left side from brachiocephalix down here. So if your zone of mixing is just above the left brachiocephalic, but not enough, and just before the right, what's going to happen? The left guy is going to get good amount of blood, oxygenated blood. But the right brachiocephalic or right side of the body or right brain, what will they receive? They will receive potentially slightly deoxygenated blood. In the case your lungs are not perfect, you know, they go through and you have very low PO2. So that's called differential hypoxia. Now there are ways you can, uh, you know, mitigate or you can, you know, improve things. What you could do is, if the patient is not intubated, you can always intubate them or give them high flow so that you oxygenate the blood which is coming anterograde. You can potentially reduce your ECMO flows because it may be that your native heart function has improved so much that you really don't need that kind of support, and you can let your native, fun you know, function to get better. Now, we had a patient who had a similar problem. He was a 600 pounder. Keith, I don't know if you remember. So that patient <clears throat> was a heavy man, and we had this zone of mixing here at the diaphragm, the level of diaphragm. So uh, I think that's one of the, I only heard it once, and we keep talking about it, and another center tried it. So our surgeons here, they decided to put a venous cannula, which is usually a longer cannula as opposed to an arterial cannula, they put it into the artery and placed it really high up near the diaphragm. And the idea was they could push blood directly in there. That particular patient, by the way, was not ready to be weaned. That's why they did this. So that they could change the zone of mixing by artificially positioning a cannula high up here. So they had a short cannula that was perfusing everything from the renals till here. And they had a long cannula which was sitting in the iota way up and was jetting blood directly so that it could reach the arch. So, again, uh, you know, different things can be used. Distal limb perfusion, another thing, uh, you know, important with VA ACMO, especially if you're doing a femoral approach. If you have cannulas, 
which are almost the size of your arteries, you don't get any perfusion down to your legs. So most centers preemptively put distal, distal uh, <coughs> limb perfusion cannulas. Basically, they are bypass cannulas uh, to support the lower extremities. All right, weaning. So again, just like VB, here the weaning approaches, if you're able to maintain good maps with minimal inotropic vasopressor support, if you have good pulsatile flow on your A lines and PA lines, that's a uh, you know, sign of cardiac recovery. If you're on the lowest dose of inotropes, ideally off pressors, or sometimes you have to wean because these patients are having a complication. So very, very important to figure out what is it, you know, to understand the science of recovery. So echo plays a very, very important part in determining your LV recovery. A few things you can see on that. Sometimes you need a TEE based on the body habitus of the patient. So specifically look for how does the LV and RV function look like? You know, what is the size? You know, are they working okay? What is the degree of MR or TR? So just a few hint points I've written here. If you have very high tricuspid regurgitation, that means you need a little bit more RV support. So you need to have more ECMO flow or some kind of other RV support. If you have a very, very high MR, that means blood is going back. You need more LV venting. Okay? If you have a, whether you have a balanced septum, it should be ideally midline and contracting. So a few things you can see on the echo to see if your heart's recovering. So again, <clears throat> you know, VB ECMO, you can actually run without anticoagulation for extended periods of time. Uh, many, many centers have been doing it. V ECMO, unfortunately, you don't have the luxury. You need to have full-blown anticoagulation in these people, ideally. Now, if the patient is bleeding, you have no choice because you're <clears throat> otherwise going to have uh, an embolism to the brain. So these people, ideally, you should have a CVP line, you know, an imaging, ongoing imaging. You have to be fully anticoagulated before you take because sometimes there's a recent uh, incident that happened under my care. We had a patient who had a femoral uh, line here. He was on not so great anticoagulation, unfortunately, because of bleeding issues. We decannulated him, and he just stroked because he had a clot sitting in the cannula, just around his cannula, which went to a systemic circulation. So again, you can reduce your ECMO flow, you know, every five, 10 minutes by 0.5, and see where you reach. And then, if you're happy with your press, you know, with all your hemodynamics, you can go down. So judge your success based on your maps, whatever you want to keep, more than 65, 70, CVP, RV contractility. So that's the reason some centers actually leave uh, uh, a limited view TEE device inside. And when they are weaning, they just take it up, you know, they just slowly wean and keep watching what's happening, real time data. So <clears throat> I think Jessica, I remember you telling me a few years back, her favorite line was, it takes a village to run an ECMO, and it's really true. You know, if any physician or any perfusionist or any ECMO specialist thinks that we are the king, sorry, that's not the case. We need a complete team, and we need unison amongst the team. Every team member has to speak in the same language, you know, about ventilator settings, about V ECMO, VV ECMO. That actually improves the outcome. And you know, it's so great that uh, under Keith's leadership and Enrique's leadership before, at this program, we had such beautiful unison that led to beautiful outcomes here. I've been to other programs and the current program. We have been uh, marred by too many power struggles and people doing different things on the same patient. So it's very, very important that we understand the team dynamics of ECMO. All right, we'll spend, how much time do I have now? 10 minutes? None? Okay, we'll just breeze through this, all right. <laughs> all right, three minutes more, okay? Anybody has a gun down here, three minutes? No? You can shoot. All right, so this, we'll just briefly talk about uh, complications, all right? So if you see the literature here, oxygen failure, 17 and a half percent, so you can divide your complications into you know, circuit and patient-related complications. So oxygenator failure is fairly high. Uh, clotting, blood clots in, in the oxygenator or uh, others also fairly high. Bleeding, so 
The overall, if you uh, look at the ELSO data, they'll tell you 52% is the incidence of bleeding in ECMO. That's combined VA and VB ECMO. So here, in this, in, this is a New England article by Dan Brody. They actually found it to be a little bit less, but the most feared complication is intracranial hemorrhage. Actually, fortunately, that's under 5%. And even with, in VB ECMO, it's even lower when you don't use anticoagulant therapy. It's under 2%, I would say. All right, this is another uh, meta-analysis of VB ECMO. We'll skip this. All right. So the question is, why do you really care about complications? People say that, well, if there's a complication, we can take care of it, you know. It's important to prevent these complications. And the reason for that is if you look down here, if you have complications, see, a viral pneumonia would otherwise survive, you know, 66% survival. If you have any kind of these failure, look how the survival drops. It almost drops by 15, 20 points automatically. Same thing with VA ECMO, you know, your survival is not great except for viral myocarditis. But if you happen to have any kind of problem, bam, everything goes 20 points down. So very important, be on top of that to prevent the complication from happening. All right, thrombosis. Uh, let's see if there's any other interesting, we'll just uh, see photographs for a minute. Some breeze through photographs. All right, I really like this slide. You know, this whoever this guy was, he was super, you know, excited. You know, he was putting an. It seems that this is an Avalon cannula going all the way here somewhere. What's this part of the heart? You think this is okay? This is an overzealous fellow, or this is this is rightly placed? All right, this is just a, a slide to fool you guys. This is actually a protect duo, which these guys are showing outside. It actually sits in the pulmonary artery. It's supposed to be there, okay? The one, <coughs> all right, now you can have other cannula migrations. You can have it in the RV. Sometimes you can have it, see, all the way here in the hepatic vein. So we had one case when I was a fellow here. We had a case where we had it in the hepatic vein. Massive liver failure, you know, uh, liver shock, the patient, Otherwise, oxygenation was beautiful, everything's beautiful, but the cannula was too deep into the hepatic vein. Hepatic engorgement, and they had a massive liver, they had thrombosis, and uh, uh, patient died, unfortunately, of hepatic failure. So I think other folks will talk about this bleeding, stroke. All right, so one last slide, you know, very, very important. So say for example, we're not, support, we're not ECMO specialists, you know, not everybody's ECMO specialist, not everybody needs to touch the ECMO circuit, but all of you who ever, ever see an ECMO patient should know one foremost thing, and what is that? That is, in case you have an emergency, emergency is defined by if you have to come off ECMO for any reason, for all these reasons, air embolus, breach of circuit, console failure, or accidental decannulation, you should know one thing, how to isolate the patient and save the patient from any of the circuit complications. So important, think about VA and AV. So when you have a patient and you want to save them, the first limb that you isolate is your arterial limb so that you don't send anything to the patient. Then you can clamp the venous later. When you're releasing, putting them back on ECMO, you release the venous side first, and then you release the arterial. Because if you release the arterial first, there is no preload, right? There's nothing that's going, all is air. 